God designed us for life, an abundant life with him and with one another. But there's a problem. Someone has taken our life. Jesus said the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. We're missing out on life like God intended because we go looking for life in all the wrong places. But there is a solution to this problem. Jesus said he came so that we may have life and have it in abundance. That's why Cross United Church exists, to help people find life like God intended. We believe life like God intended happens when three things are united in our lives. When we're brought to God in wholehearted worship through the cross of Jesus Christ, when we're brought together in authentic community, when we're deployed on the joyful mission that God has for us in the world, we experience fullness of life. Life like God intended, united in wholehearted worship, authentic community, and joyful mission is why Cross United Church exists. Hey, Cross United, so glad you've joined us for this online message. I want to encourage you to turn or tap in your Bible or your app to John 13, verses 6 through 11. We're going to be talking about ways we get in the way from John 13. While you're turning there, I want to remind you, you can go to crossunited.org and click online check-in. That will take you to our digital connection card where you can fill out a little information about yourself so that we can get to know you a little bit better. And there's also there a, a space for you to let us know ways we can be praying for you. Um, also there at crossunited.org, there is the giving tab on the far right-hand side of the screen. I want to encourage you, if you consider Cross United your church home or you just consider yourself a generous person to click give, that will take you to our secure online giving platform. As a new church, we are working toward maturity and self-sufficiency, where most of our uh, financial resources come from within our congregation rather than outside of our congregation. So appreciate you doing that. Also, women, ladies, I want to invite you to join into the next round of the Women's Bible Study on Tuesday. It starts this Tuesday, January 19th at 7.15 p.m. You all will be doing Jen Wilkins' God of Covenant Bible Study. It's going to be fantastic. You can email laura at crossunited.org for that. Also, men, Thursday morning, 6.30 a.m., join us for our weekly Zoom call where we study scripture together. We encourage one another. We pray for one another. I know this past week, it just refueled and encouraged my spirit uh, there was just a sense of, of, of fellowship and joy, and, uh, and if you're not there, you're missing out. And so I encourage you to be there Thursday mornings at 6.30 a.m. Now, let's set the scene for the sermon this morning. I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine having a quarter of a billion, yes with a B, billion dollars at your fingertips, but not being able to access it. That's the position a man named Stefan Thomas finds himself in. There was a, a story this week about this. You may have seen it. I want to read you the intro to that story. Stefan Thomas, a German-born programmer living in San Francisco, has two guesses left to figure out a password that is worth, as of this week, about $220 million. The password will let him unlock a small hard drive known as an iron key, which contains the private keys to a digital wallet that holds 7,002 Bitcoin. While the price of Bitcoin dropped sharply Monday, it is still up more than 50% from just a month ago when it passed its previous all-time high of around $20,000. The problem is that Mr. Thomas, years ago, lost the paper where he wrote down the password for his iron key, which gives users 10 guesses before it seizes up and encrypts its contents forever. He has since tried eight of his com most commonly used password formulations to no avail. Now that provokes anxiety, just thinking about it, to, to have that resource so close at hand but to have, have lost the password and to be two attempts away from, from being locked out of it forever. And this should hit us even closer to heart as followers of Jesus and as people who know the scripture or study the scripture or who are learning the scripture or interested in, in the things of Christ and Christianity because what he offers us is worth so much more than all of the Bitcoin or billions in the world. He offers us limitless life, hope, healing, and salvation. He offers us eternity. And it's right there for us to receive from him. But so often we get 
in the way. Like Mr. Thomas, Stefan Thomas lost that slip of paper with the password. We lose the way and we get in the way of the way to what Jesus wants to offer to us. In the most startling story of the life of Jesus, we see Jesus humble, maybe we even should say humiliate himself by doing something nobody in history had ever done, at least as far as we know, and that is a superior washing the feet of an inferior. And we see there in John 13, we're going to just set the context here in verses 1 through 5, before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel, tied it around himself, Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around him. Now here we see, and if you missed the last message, it's online at crossunited.org, where we see that security leads to serving, that secure people serve people, that, that Jesus is so secure in the when, who, where, and why, that he, can tr- that he can serve in a way that nobody would have imagined a master serving his followers. He is so secure in the time that God had prepared, the identity that God had given, the place his father had called, and the purpose his father had commissioned, that he is able to perform this second most radical act of service in human history. The first most radical being his crucifixion, which this scene foreshadows. And as he washes the the dirt and the dung and And last week, my kids were listening to the message. They didn't realize that dung means poop, like that there was raw sewage in the middle of many of these ancient streets as these disciples would have been walking through and there would have been dust and all sorts of junk on their feet. So this was a disgusting and menial task. And as he's doing that, he comes around to his disciples and he gets to Peter and Peter protests. And that's where we find ourselves in 13 verse 6. He came to Simon Peter who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I'm doing now, you don't realize. But afterward, you will understand. You will never wash my feet, Peter said. Jesus replied, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. One who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. This is why he said, not all of you are clean. Now in this dialogue, in this conversation between Peter and Jesus, we see four ways we get in the way. There are three ways Peter gets in the way of what Jesus is offering to him and what he needs from Christ. And then there is a fourth way, the terrifyingly final way. The first three ways are curable and the final way is final. And so we're going to see these ways. And the first way is that we get in the way because of ignorance. We get in the way because of ignorance. He came to Simon Peter who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Now to understand Peter's reaction, you have to understand that in the ancient world, foot washing was just a normal practice of hospitality and hygiene. There was, there was nothing special about it except for the fact that people needed to wash their feet because their feet were dirty. And, and in the Old Testament, which was translated into Greek, what, what we call the Septuagint, the word here for wash, which isn't actually that common, is used a number of times. And it's used in 
two ways. First, it's used for normal washing, standard hygiene type washing, often for washing someone's feet. But the second way it's used is for ceremonial cleansing to enter the presence of God. The first way, though, it just refers to someone washing their feet because their feet are dirty. So, for example, in Genesis 18, and there's other places like this, it says these, these angels visit Abraham. He says, let a little water be brought so that you may wash your feet and rest yourselves under a tree. And so a, a host would provide water for someone to wash their own feet. Maybe uh, a servant would wash the feet of someone and honored yes, but, but, but it was seen as just an, an act of hospitality to provide a place for someone to wash their feet so that they could be clean when entering into uh, conversation and having a meal and that sort of thing. But there's a second way the word wash is used. For example, in Exodus chapter 30, says, the Lord spoke to Moses, make a bronze basin for washing and a bronze stand for it. Set it between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Aaron and his sons must wash their hands and feet from the basin. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting or approach the altar to minister by burning a food offering to the Lord, they must wash with water so that they will not die. They must wash their hands and feet so that they will not die. This is to be a permanent statute for them, for Aaron and his descendants throughout their generations. So check out what's happening here. Peter assumes, understandably, that this is the first kind of foot washing, that, that this is merely a standard hygiene hospitality thing, that, that their feet need to be clean because they are dirty. But what he doesn't understand, and what Jesus is going to explain, is that Jesus is not just performing an act of hygiene, but he is preparing him for holiness. He, he's doing what, what needs to be done for Peter, not just from a physical standpoint, but he is illustrating a spiritual reality. What Jesus is really doing is he's combining the, the two ways we see the, the washing used in the Old Testament into a single act that is both an example of what the disciples should be doing and an illustration of what the disciples need. And, and Peter... Peter, in all the, with all the good motives in the world, protests because he misunderstands. Paul says of his Jewish brothers in Romans 10, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Peter is ignorant of what Jesus is actually doing. And that's where Jesus says, what I'm doing now, you don't realize, but afterward you will understand. We get in the way of what Jesus wants to do because of our ignorance of Jesus' word. We're so saturated by the Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook feeds of, uh, on our phones. We're so saturated by the stuff we're watching on Netflix or Hulu or Disney+. Plus. We're so saturated with XYZ news. We're so saturated with the, the noises and the voices of this world that we don't know what Jesus is calling. We don't know what Jesus is saying. We don't know him deeply, intimately. We can know a thousand things about a thousand things. We can read the news and get caught up on the latest things that are happening through online news or TV news. We can know a thousand things about a thousand things and read all sorts of books, but we can miss the most important thing. We need to get into the Word of God. You need to get into the Word of God. You need to let it saturate your mind. You need to let it soak into your heart. Like a marinade for, for, for when sometimes we grill food and we'll marinate. Um, you have to marinate it long enough so that the, that the the, the marinade penetrates all the way through the meat, so the flavors all the way through. You need to let your mind and your heart and your spirit marinate in the Word of God long enough that it soaks in beyond the surface. You need to get into the Word. 
That's the way Jesus gets us out of our own way. We get in our own way because of ignorance. And the, the solution to that is Jesus, letting Jesus teach us and letting him deconstruct our ignorance through his word. And as we lean into his word and his spirit by faith, and as we listen in community and study and learn in community in the context of the church, we begin to learn and grow and our ignorance begins to dissolve. And we learn who Jesus is. We learn what truth is. We learn who God is, how God made us. And the Bible, don't get me wrong, is a complex and multi-layered book written thousands of years ago in a different language, multiple different languages and translated for us today. So I'm not saying that it's always easy and I'm not saying it doesn't take work and study. It does. I'm not saying it doesn't take community. It absolutely does. But what I am saying is that if you have the spirit of God, you should be hungering for the word of God and letting the word be louder than the world around you. We get in our own way because of ignorance. We also get in our own way because of pride. You will never wash my feet, Peter said. Jesus replied, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Now just hold on to that for a second. When he says, you will never wash my feet, um, literally, he he's using the most emphatic way to say, he's He's saying never, like there's actually two uh, words in Greek that, that, that refer to the way he says not. He says it two times and then he says, you will never, actually you will never wash my feet into eternity. This is, he, he, he's trying to elevate Jesus, saying, Jesus, no, 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 you are the one who's worthy of being served. Not me. I need to serve you. And so P Peter's motives are seemingly righteous. He, 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 he thinks he's honoring Christ. He thinks he's exalting Christ. But his ignorance mixes with his pride because he doesn't realize that what he needs is not to exalt Jesus and to serve Jesus, but to let Jesus serve him. He needs to be clean. And he can't clean himself. Throughout the scripture, we see the need for cleansing from sin. For example, after David's great fall of sin with the, the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba, and, the, and the, the, the setting of Uriah off to, to war so that he would be killed, um, we see David repent before the Lord in Psalm 51, and he says, completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. What Peter misses here is he misses how desperately he needs Jesus and how little Jesus actually needs him. He thinks he's elevating Jesus, but he's actually elevating Peter. He thinks he's elevating Jesus by saying, no, 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 no. You shouldn't be washing my feet. I should be washing your feet. His pride thinks that he has something to offer to Jesus when in reality, Jesus has something to offer to him. Scripture uses two pictures to describe salvation. It uses the picture of birth and it uses the picture of resurrection. So birth, you think about birth, um, a baby has no active role in their own conception, gestation, or birth. When, when Laura, you know, gave, gave birth to our kids, um, she, she, she was the one doing the work and the kids were just along for the ride. And with Livy, our, our youngest, she kind of shot out like a rocket. The doctor had to catch her. Thank, thankfully, she caught her. No, nothing bad happened. But the babies were completely passive and at the mercy of the doctors and the mom. Peter himself says, after having learned this lesson, 
years later, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We play no more part in our own new birth than a baby plays in his or her physical birth. The other picture the scripture uses is the picture of resurrection. We don't contribute to our own resurrection any more than Lazarus contributed to his resurrection. Remember in John 11, we studied uh, a few months ago where Lazarus, Jesus' friend, has died and he's been dead for four days and his, his body's starting to, to decompose and his sisters are heartbroken and Jesus goes and he raises Lazarus from the grave. There we see in John eleven forty three, 43, Jesus sh shouts, Lazarus, come out! And it says, the dead man came out bound, hand and foot with linen strips, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said, unwrap him and let him go. We don't contribute anything to our salvation any more than Lazarus contributed to his resurrection. We don't contribute anything to our salvation other than our need to be saved. We get in the way because of our pride, because we think we have something to offer in exchange for God's grace. But as 1 John 4, 10, one of my favorite verses in the Bible says, love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. What are some ways you elevate yourself when you think you're elevating Jesus, where you're trying to serve Jesus but what you really need is to let Jesus serve you. Where you're trying to help Jesus out when Jesus says, I don't need any help. I need you to simply appropriate, grab a hold by grace through faith of what I'm offering to you. Where Jesus says, I, I gave my life on the cross and I was buried and raised from the dead. And you have no part to play except to receive and believe. We get in our own way because of ignorance we get in our own way because of pride and we also get in our own way because of unbelief simon peter said to him lord not only my feet but also my hands and my head one who has bathed jesus told him doesn't need to wash anything except his feet but he is completely clean you are clean but not all of you at this point, Peter oscillates. He, he switches from unbelieving pride to unbelieving fear. He's moved from thinking he has something to offer to Jesus to, to thinking that what Jesus is offering to him is not sufficient. He says, well, if my feet need to be clean, clean so does my head and my hands. I, I'm so, I, woe is me. I am a sinner in need of cleansing. He, he gets it now, but he gets it to the point where he doesn't trust that what Jesus says is enough is in fact enough. He doesn't trust as he's going to write or as, as, as we're going to see at the end of John's gospel, as John the Apostle writes, that it is finished means that what Jesus says is enough for our forgiveness and our cleansing and our healing and our salvation is enough. What, what, what Peter doesn't understand, what Peter doesn't understand, and Jesus uses this illustration, like if you've bathed, in that day, if you'd bathe and wash yourself, your hands and your head, then the only thing that would get dirty as you're going through the day on a normal day would be your feet. And, and, and Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I need to wash your feet and you'll be clean. What we try to do, what Peter tries to do, we try to improve on what Jesus has done. He says, I'm going to wash your feet and it's enough. We say, no, 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 no. You need to, you need to do more. And what we, what we find ourselves doing there is, is that we think that through our acts of penance or repentance or obedience or service or ministry that we somehow add on to what Jesus has done. We, we somehow complete the already completed work of Christ and we begin to work for 
our salvation rather than from our salvation. We begin to work for our cleansing rather than from our cleansing. We begin to work for our freedom rather than from our freedom. We begin to work for our sonship or our adoption in Christ rather than from our sonship, our adoption in Christ. We begin to work for righteousness rather than from righteousness. And what Jesus says here is that the engine in our life is his work on our behalf and the gas and the engine is the Holy Spirit and, and that we merely need to receive and believe what he has done for us and trust that it is enough. It's finished. Yes, we obey, we serve, we sacrifice, but we do it because Jesus has first obeyed and served and sacrificed in our place. And we wash the dust and the dung from the feet of the saints because Jesus has first washed the dust and the dung from our own feet. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore he is able to completely save those who come to God through him since he always lives to intercede for them. Augustine said, He who intercedes for us washes our feet for us daily. We're in daily need of his grace and trust him. It is enough. Are you trying to add on to the perfect and finished work of Christ? Are you trying to work for salvation, for acceptance, for forgiveness, for healing, for cleansing? Or are you working from salvation, from forgiveness, from healing, from cleansing, from righteousness, from adoption, from your union with Christ. If you are in Christ, your life is hidden with Christ in God, and you're safe, you're secure, and you're free to serve. We get in our own way because of ignorance, because of pride, because of unbelief, but there's a fourth way, and this is the terrifyingly final way. The way not of Peter, but of Judas. We get in the way because of rejection. For he, Jesus, knew who would betray him. This is why he said, not all of you are clean. This is the incurable condition. You know, if, if you grow grown up in the church or grown up as a Christian like like I did, basically from, from the time my parents met Jesus when I was two years old, you learn about something called the unforgivable sin. And if you have a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and a sensitivity to your spiritual life, you wonder sometimes if you have committed the unforgivable sin. And, and I, I worried about this at different points. And what I learned along the way is that if you've worried about committing the unforgivable sin, you probably haven't committed it because the unforgivable sin is basically an ongoing hard-hearted rebellion and rejection of Jesus. And this is where Judas found himself. He had rejected Jesus. And this is the terrifying place where you don't want to find yourself. We all fall into ignorance, pride, and unbelief in various times and in various ways all along the way of our Christian life. But don't let your heart get hard. This is the tenth try for Stefan Thomas's iron key. This is the final attempt that locks him out of the riches that are his or could have been his forever. Don't let your hearts grow hard. Do not get in your own way. Turn to Christ in faith and be saved and be cleansed. Turn away from your ignorance. Get into the scripture. Turn away from your pride and trust that what Jesus says is enough is enough and that your new birth and your resurrection are uh, so, solely given to you by grace. Turn away from your unbelief, whether unbelieving pride or unbelieving fear, and let Jesus whisper into your heart and thunder over your life that it is finished and you are clean if you are in him.